Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. All right, everybody. We have Danilo Cuellar on the line today on the flagship Danilo, welcome to our podcast, finally. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me on the show. Really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. I think we, we arranged this, uh, it was about a month ago, month and a half ago, and I was really excited to have you on the program because I'm a fan of what you do over there, and you're pretty prolific. You turn out quite a few podcasts, a lot of writing, um, some really entertaining memes, to say the least, and some great discussions <laughs> on your on your social media. And I'm like, I got to have this guy in line. And then, you know, Danny uh, uh, got on your program. I think he was on your program a couple weeks ago, maybe. Right. After like Christmas. That. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, we're really happy to have you on, especially considering our topic, which is something that we have not broached on the flagship freedom. And that is the topic of um, children's rights, which is a topic that for some libertarians, it is uh, very difficult uh, to sort of um, uh, to parse through. There's a lot of prominent libertarians, anarcho-capitalists that have that sit on um, two different fences. Now, I, look, I don't want to give you the wrong impression, our audience the wrong impression, that um, all of these anarcho-capitalists and libertarians hate children, are not compassionate individuals, but a lot of them are, um, there are some of them that believe that we cannot legally enforce certain children's rights or children's rights, children's autonomy, before or basically the autonomy of anyone unless they are able to uh, essentially declare their bodily ownership or their self-ownership. And without those sorts of things, a parent might not be legally obligated to provide certain things, um, or maybe even it might be permissible to spank you know, their kids, or that might be permissible to abort their children. There's a variety of issues that are uh, wrapped up in this. And I want to delve into this topic, somewhat controversial, but I know Danilo, you you did say that you didn't find this maybe quite as muddled and murky a uh, topic as perhaps other libertarians. So that's also really exciting because maybe we can learn from you. I'm hoping to learn quite a bit on this conversation. Yeah, that's um, definitely a big focus of my channel, uh, my podcast, mm -hmm. my um, my writings, um, because you know I, I have uh, two kids, a six year old and a four year old, and yeah. I started on this path. Um, by listening to the the very first video I heard on this topic was um, Stefan Molyneux, the video um, uh, 17 Reasons Not to Spank Your Child that my wife mm. sent me. And then, so I never heard of Stefan Molyneux at that time. And then I, I was uh, checking out his other videos and oh my God, this guy's got a lot of stuff. So I learned a lot about economics and volunteerism and anarchy from that. And, yeah. and so it really uh, opened the door for me. Um, but peaceful parenting, I think, is real. It's foundational to my message um, because, you know, I think that um, we can talk to adults 
and it's wonderful to talk to adults. However, um, I think it's the Frederick Douglass quote, right? It's, it's easy to raise what is it, compassionate children than to repair broken men, something like that. Mm. Um, so, so you know, it's very difficult to talk to some people because they're so entrenched in their beliefs, and many times it's not just a logic problem, it's an emotional problem, right? You know, that's essentially what Stockholm Syndrome is. It's just not a problem with understanding the logic. It's, it's like it's got all these layers like an onion of, of emotional involvement in this ideology that they were, uh, you know, told to believe through various, um, you know, stages in their life. And so, and so it's very, very difficult to break through all that. You can, but it's just very difficult. So, so I think one of the best ways that we can produce you know people who promote freedom and peace and and compassion uh to bring about a better future is to start with the children you know raise them um with respect you know with empathy with compassion with kindness with gentleness and and in that way we will produce the future the world that we want to see right they're going to become the people that populate the world of tomorrow and so i tell people whatever way that you want the world to be for your children, that's how you raise your children. Yeah, that's, that's really a, a, a wonderful thing that you say. And I, and I'm, and it's very interesting that your introduction to it, it, am I right to say that your introduction to anarcho-capitalism, voluntarism it, is through uh, Stefan Molyneux? Yeah, definitely. That was that was your introduction. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it was actually in many ways. He was actually in many ways um, uh, an introducer of those ideas to me as well, even though I had been, uh, I don't know, somewhat of a, a libertarian conservative something. I don't know. I, I, I maybe I call myself a centrist. I never really never knew what to think of myself. I had strong political convictions and philosophical opinions, but I never really cared much for labels. But uh, Danny was the one that actually sent me Molyneux stuff, and I really got involved in some of his earlier stuff. And then, you know, since then, he's become like the Pravda for Trump, uh, unfortunately, right. <laughs> no. uh, which which is is so unfortunate, so very unfortunate. And, and Danny and I continue to talk about how we want to we want to do a dissection of some of his later later pieces, because it's almost like he's gone off the deep end. Like, where is that like fantastic, fantastically consistent anarcho capitalist that really got me into this? Um, but anyways, um, but yeah, that is, I think, his greatest contribution to our our movement. I think that the peaceful parenting, what he did, I mean, he's, conv he's convinced people like uh, uh, Stefan Kinsella, he's talked to Walter Block about this sort of stuff. He's done some wonderful things in the realm of peaceful parenting. Uh, and I really admire at least that, you know, that aspect of it. And it seems like maybe you're the torchbearer, the new torchbearer for this sort of, this sort of message. So, um, so I, yeah, I want to get into this because um, let me kind of frame this issue, and I want to read uh, a little bit from the introduction. This is chapter fourteen of uh, the Ethics of Liberty, and you know, it, a podcast on on anarcho capitalism would be really incomplete without at least quoting Murray Rothbard once or twice all, every so often. So I, I, I got to start with this, this quote on chapter, chapter 14, The Ethics of Liberty, and it goes like this. There remains, however, the difficult case of children. The right of ownership by each man has been established for adults, for natural self-owners, who must use their minds to select and pursue their ends. On the one hand, it is clear that a newborn babe is, n is in no natural sense an existing self-owner, but rather a potential self-owner. But this poses a difficult problem. For when, or in what way, does a growing child acquire his natural right to liberty and self-ownership? Gradually, or all at once? At what age? And what criteria do we set forth for this shift or transition? So... Um, Murray goes on to, to, you know, Rothbard goes on to say that, uh, that essentially parents do not have the positive obligations to clothe or feed, um, their children to take care of the children in any way, um, you know, after the child is born. And he also has something to say about abortion as well, but let's leave it till, you know, post, uh, post, uh, birth right now. 
and uh, and talk about that. So yeah, he says that we don't have any positive obligations towards children. Now he doesn't he doesn't think that we should either murder or torture um, or harm the child, but we don't have to take care of it. We could just you know evict the child from the home, and it could go and you know and now it, start. Go on. I just want to toss this in there. Was did he actually believe that, or because? I, well, my understanding is he's a decent guy. Was he exploring right. the limits of legally? Legally, we can't enforce. You know, we can't take it to the parents for you know for for setting their kid out to you know to starve. Would he really believe that though, or was he just legally? illustrating the what he perceived to be a shortfall or a a, a gap in the not strictly non-aggression principle philosophy? Because I mean, I don't. I can't think of anybody who would stand by and do nothing and, and hold the parents not liable for tossing your kid out in the cold. I mean, that well, I do think that he recognized it as immoral, but I don't believe that it was justifiably enforceable or that a parent had the legal obligation to do, as I said, this this positivistic legal obligation to their children, whether he might say that it was, you know, it's a bad thing to do. But I don't think that he was a very strong. I at least if you are if what you're saying is true and 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 he actually believed that it was maybe a hole in it. He really didn't seem to articulate it very well in ethics. Maybe I'm mistaken, Danilo. What are your thoughts on that? So, I I usually respond to that uh, assertion with the argument of um, the assumption of responsibility. Um, which I remember Tom Woods um, mentioning the example of if um, if an airplane pilot uh, has passengers and you know they pay uh, to get their ticket to come on the plane and then they go up in there in the air what twenty thousand feet and then <laughs> in the air the uh, pilot says all right I don't want you on my plane it's my private property get out. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> is that is that um, how you say justified? Because that's his private property, right? Um, mm. And uh, is that a violation of pri property rights if people don't jump out of the plane? <laughs> and I don't think anybody would assert that. Um, and so the way that he would describe that, which I like a lot, is um, that people in the fact that you know they're 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 paying the money, they get on the plane, they're put in a unique situation of vulnerability. Um, mm. that the pilot is in control of. And so it doesn't really apply the same as if they're on land. You know, you can't just kick somebody out, right? So it's different, you know. You, you are assuming responsibility. You, you're uh, it's, uh, assuming an obligation. And the same thing with parenting, right? Um, the parents chose to have a child, right? The child did not choose to be a child, right? And so... It's, it was the choice of the parents to be parents, you know, assuming that the woman was not raped, of course. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's a consensual thing. And so, you know, the child is innocent. And, and so I don't think there is, um, you know, morally a right, of course, to just, you know, let your child freeze. Because, yeah, you do have responsibilities and duties because you made that choice. You assume mm. those responsibilities. Um now, whether that's legally enforceable or not, yeah, I don't. I don't know. We, we don't. I don't like to talk about legality. <laughs> you know, it's being voluntary. So I don't really discuss what's legal or not. You know, I focus on what's moral. To me, that's m much more important. Well, and but by legal in a in a free society, could, do you view it as acceptable to use force against parents who toss their kid out in the cold or an unborn child, etc.? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see that as being. Um, acceptable behavior of of uh you know good parents in any society pretty much i don't know maybe if you're living in sparta you know they uh <laughs> they put the babies out to get strong or actually as a pretty extreme example wim hof i don't know if you heard have you heard of wim hof no uh this guy who's like mastered the uh the art of uh i mean he's not a child of course but mastered the art of of um being in extremely cold temperatures with like just a t-shirt and shorts <laughs> huh. kind of fascinating you know he's like you see you see people who learn this method he, they can meditate in the snow and the snow is melting around them um but that's a little bit different <laughs> uh, i don't know what i remind me of but um but yeah so so you know and, and you know talking about um you know self-ownership of the child right 
you know, Jim Limber Davis, um, my other friend who I'm doing a podcast with, The Philosophy of Altruism, um, we discussed this a little bit, and and his his um, the way he describes it is that the child is the property of the parents. Now, I don't really like to say that; it doesn't even sound right to most people. Like, what? My child's my your child is your property? No, it doesn't mm-hmm. really sound right. But the way he means that is that is that they are, um, you know, like like Murray said, they don't have full self ownership because they don't have all the skills necessary for independence. And over time, as they gain those skills. Um, you know, they become more and more, uh, they come to own themselves until they can fully uh, live on their own. And so in that way, you know, you, I guess as you take care of your property, you would take care of your child. You know, so parents are the guardians. They make sure that um, that the child does not harm themselves, you know, in an extreme, you know, running out into the, you know, into the road, you know, extreme things like that. Um, for the most part, that's about it. To me, that's what parenting is: is being a guardian, being an advisor, being a peer, being a friend. Um, you know, and uh, if they if they have questions about things, you know, you ask they, they ask their parents because parents have more experience. But for the most part, I look at parenting as guardianship, not like superiority. You know, I'm superior to them. No, no, mm. not. Yeah, I I want to make it very clear, and and I'll articulate this a little bit later that I do I certainly don't agree with Rothbard. I actually believe that there is a a a both a legal and a moral obligation, a positivistic responsibility that a parent has um to their to their children. Uh and this would preclude any let's say starvation or throwing them out or even right. even in my opinion uh, evicting them or aborting them uh, evictionism is what what uh, Murray Rothbard um, and uh, and Walter Block referred to the process of abortion being because you know we're, libertarians aren't so keen on murder here so you know eviction is used instead to to remove the child from the womb but but I want to actually go back to something that you said you said that you aren't very interested in in what is legal, um, rather what is moral. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Right. Now, so does that mean that that there are? I, I would make the proposal that all you know, and I think that you might agree that all that is legal may not be moral, and all that is moral might not be legal. Yeah. Does that does that sound right? right? Yeah. Sounds right. Mm-hmm. But. But the sort of the sort of um, normative statements that we're proposing in a in a voluntary society, you wouldn't consider, let's say, the um, you know the ideas of um, self ownership. Would you consider them to be a, you know a law or natural rights in that sense? The way that I describe natural rights is um, mm-hmm. the principle of um, has to be universalizable, right? Has to be mm-hmm. able to be applied universally to everyone. There, there are no right. exceptions, right, to natural law, which is exactly why the state is Ill- an illegitimate institution, right? Right. Um, they claim the exemption to the laws of morality that we are all subject to. So, um, self ownership. Yeah, I think it's it's the foundation of volunteerism. It's um, it's self evident in that um, you know we own ourselves and 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 our and our actions and the products of our the fruits of our labor, and anyone who would try to deprive you of those things would be violating your natural rights and uh, would be committing a crime or a theft. Right. So I guess what I'm getting at is that um, a you know, if somebody is in violation of um, the natural law uh, of of self ownership, somebody aggresses upon you. You have the legal enforceability to defend yourself. Would you use the word legal in that sense? No. Or would you no, say no, the right? Would you would say uh, yeah, the, I would just say you, you, you have the moral right to defend yourself. Sure, a self the moral de- right. Self defense okay. is not. Um, you know, people often confuse. You know, when you when you say uh, you know we're against violence. Um, you know, people think we're pacifists. No, I don't think so, because I think every every organism has the right to defend itself, right? And you know, you know, animals have claws and teeth and venom and poison and everything, and uh, you know, human beings are no different, right? We we have we have um, the desire for self preservation, and yeah. and I think that has the basis in self ownership, right? Nobody really wants to die, you know. Everybody wants to thrive and to live and to survive, 
And so um, if somebody is threatening your survival, you have every moral right to defend yourself. Mm. Okay, well, I guess I guess what I'm trying I'd like to make the the distinction then because in in some in some cultures or customs or let's say religions, you might have something that is morally uh, unacceptable. Let's say you know homosexuality in Christianity. Mm. Um, that may be morally uh, you know immoral in Christianity, but it isn't legally enforceable to prevent you know, two homosexuals to have sex in a voluntary society. Mm -hmm. So it may be, perhaps you might use the word custom, perhaps you might wor use the word, um, you know, a Christian would certainly use the word moral. Mm -hmm. And may the fact that you don't agree with them might not necessarily preclude, preclude that that is immoral for them. Now, of course, you know, I'm not trying to get into like subjective morality here and all that sort of stuff, because in a voluntary society, we all have the basic understanding of property rights, uh, and and self ownership, and then we build off of that with other customs and cultural nuances and things like that. So we might have additional structures that do not violate those things, those sorts of things, but are are um, um, I'm, I wouldn't want to say add-ons, but things that maybe are not in the purview of libertarianism. Um, like you know, is there a god? Should I worship the god? How do I worship the god? Um, and all this sort of stuff, which may fall into the realm of morality, and you can talk about that sort of stuff, but it isn't legally enforceable. This is what I mean when I make the distinction, what is legally enforceable and what might be, you know, what might be culture, custom, um, and, and, you know, personal morals and things like this. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, ent I'm, I have entirely no problem with the way people live in different areas of the world, different customs, different traditions, yeah. um, so long as they do not hallucinate v small groups of people to have superhuman rights over huh. other people, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is the essence of the state, right? Um, the absence of that, you know, there's many ways to live, right? Um, yeah. And, and, and the, the funny thing about people... When they when we talk about volunteerism, um, is that they confuse the fact that when we say we don't want something to be illegal, as we support it. Right. <laughs> so if I say if I say uh, you know I don't think cocaine should be illegal, they say what do you want to do with cocaine? No, I didn't say that. I just <laughs> yeah, there'll be kids running through the streets with guns and cocaine up their noses and like it's just going to be chaos. It'll be anarchy. You're like, yeah, it'll be anarchy. <laughs> yeah. But so that's I mean, there'll be parents too. <laughs> right. So that's a that's an interesting distinction to make uh, with these people, but um but yeah, I mean, I I focus in my writing, in my videos, I focus very heavily on these principles. Um, mm. I'm not really concerned with other cultures, the way other people live and their traditions. No, that really doesn't concern me. All I want to know when I talk to a person is yeah. what are your morals? What do you believe is right um, to treat another human being? How do you, you know, how do you interact, right? When is, when is force justified, you know? And th the difference between self-defense and the initiation of force, very important distinction to be made right there, right? Because if we say we're against the initiation of force, people think we're against self-defense. No. <laughs> so Danilo, if I could chime in, because you brought up a very important distinction. You said, how do we treat other human beings? Right. And when Mike asked the question of morality um, in regards to religion, you know, like what about the morality of being envious or a glutton or, mm. you know, homosexuality or whatever? These are all, as we are familiar, would be considered victimless crimes mm. if you view them as moral crimes. But what's the important distinction is these would be considered in a religious setting to be a crime against God, not against your fellow human. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you could argue, you know, if you're a religious person, that God would have the right to, um, you know, use force against you however you want to, <laughs> you know, it gets a little crazy, I realize. But the, the point being that, that God would have a higher claim, um, and that's why you can you can consider those things to be immoral between you and God, but not between you, you and other human beings, right? Like you may mm -hmm. be doing something immoral in the eyes of God, but, you know, be, being a fat ass and eating too much, that's not immoral to you, to anybody else, anybody other than God, right? If, 
if you believe in God and you believe gluttony is immoral. Does that make sense? So um, this reminds me of conversations that I have um, with vegans, especially my brother because he recently turned vegan, um, <laughs> and the idea of morality, right? Because a lot of them apply morality to animals. And, yeah. and so they say that it's murder to kill animals. And mm. my my contention with that is it cannot be murder because if you truly believe that, then you should consider in the same way those people that work in the slaughterhouses, you should punish them in the same way that you would punish someone that would murder a human being. And if you don't, then it's not murder. It's something else, right? So murder and morality is are concepts to me specifically associated with human interaction. That's it. So if it's with God, I wouldn't call that morality. I would call that maybe sinfulness, right? But if it's, if mm. it's animals, it's, it's just, I don't know, killing animals. Murder is a very specific term. Theft, right? Very specific. Can you rob from an animal? Uh, they don't really understand property rights. How can you rob from an animal? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, they, um, you know, they, they don't have, I, I think you guys mentioned this before. I think I remember where uh, a- animals, they, they don't have the capacity to understand concepts, abstract you know, ideas. Um, and so how can you really empathize or how can you really, um, um, yeah, yeah. Like uh, have, it's not inter- reciprocal, inter- right? It's, it's not reciprocal. You can't really have interaction with them like you can with a human being. So, right. You can't enter into a voluntary contract right. with an animal. Right, right. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I did <laughs> really Danny. All right. Yeah, you have the floor. <laughs> okay. Let's just pause this conversation right now. Danny has the floor. Produce, let's talk produce about this, this contract. contract. I didn't sign yeah. shit, no. <laughs> but actually, that's a really good point because I think we can all agree it'd be immo- immoral in whatever, you know, we realize there's a distinction between human interaction and, you know, the man-God relationship and the man-animal relationship, but it would be wrong or immoral, I would say, to torture an animal. And we, we know that animals aren't capable of, you know, signing contracts or self-ownership, but our maybe we can learn something valuable about um, peaceful parenting and babies, you know, because we're talking about people who don't understand or are incapable of understanding and respecting uh, rights and self-ownership, but babies and animals are very similar. And we, so clearly there's something wrong with torturing a baby or an animal, right? So I think we're, we all, we need to be able to put our finger down precisely on this, this, um, sort of natural inkling that we all have, but we have a hard time defining, right? Putting putting an actual definition to it. Yeah, there, there's, there's a sort of a, a, a natural repulsion that one might have if you are bearing witness, let's say, to the torture of a dog or a cat that might go beyond, you know, maybe, maybe children might even find that repulsive that have not been culturally trained. If they see blood on the ground and a, and a dog whimpering, making somewhat human noises, I'm sorry to the audience that, you know, that have that have animals that, and because I, I'm, I'm an animal lover myself, but you know, there, there's, there's a, a knot that you get in the pit of your, in, in your stomach when you might see these sorts of pictures that are shared online, proliferated online, of dogs being tortured and all that sort of stuff. It's a natural repulsion, but the, but the, let's say the morals between a human and animal and in the, the sort of the voluntarist, uh, uh, philosophy that we are proposing might not necessarily deal with the interaction between animal and human because the animal does not does not have a will and does not comprehend the idea of entering contract, the voluntary exchange of goods and services, all these other stuff that follow. It can't homestead. I mean, you know, all this sort of stuff it can't do. But the fact that we have these sorts of repulsions, the, the sort of what what Plato called the the um, uh, daemon in the consciousness, the, the conscience that you have in your body and your mind, that you feel that sort of thing, um, that should clue us in that perhaps it isn't a right thing to do and perhaps it is an immoral thing to do, but it falls outside of what we can talk of, or what we talk about within the framework of, of libertarianism. Um, so that's, those are my thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah, and actually veganism is another, like vegan, there's a lot of vegan anarchists, right? And I don't really talk about veganism much on my show because I don't find it to be necessary to tackle that topic 
because they're I, I consider them to be wonderful people. You know, they they yeah. apply morality. They're so passionate about morality that they're willing to apply it to the natural world, and and their diets, which is amazing. Like they're, mm. they're completely really compassionate people. Um, I mean, I, I'm not. I don't think it's necessary. But if they're willing to do that, that just shows to me that they're really serious about being compassionate and kind and all that. And so yeah. I have no beef with them. <laughs> beef. <laughs> I have no problem. <laughs> I have no problem with them. <laughs> and I see no no reason why I should alien alienate myself from them. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. It doesn't fall into. Uh, into conflict with our philosophy, it can be a a very synchronic synchronistic sort of add-on uh, that w- lives in harmony with the philosophy. It doesn't. It, it, it's not something that we can compulsory. We can we can find compulsory to our peers. You know, we go and enforce the fact that they don't eat meat, but we can go and convince them that this is a bad thing to do and this is an immoral thing to do, and they can say, "Yes, you're right. I believe you," and then they choose not to eat meat, and that's a very good way of doing this sort of thing. But but what we're saying as as uh, you know members of a free society is that we can't we can't enforce the same ethics between man and man and man and animal they don't they don't apply in the same way so um but let's let's get back to um this this issue of of children and i want to bring up a couple of the reasons why i think that rothbard was was off the mark on this one and uh, a lot of rothbard's um uh well both his students and some of his uh successors uh I, I usually name Hoppe, and I'm a big fan of uh, Stephen Kinsella. Uh, Kinsella does some wonderful things with the idea of the bodily bodily ownership, bodily ownership versus property ownership, and how we come to own our bodies is different than how we come to own property. And what Kinsella says is that, and this and this will tie into the idea of the uh, of children and children's rights and all this sort of stuff. But what he says is that, and and Hoppe actually I think was the one that gave Kinsella this idea. But uh, Kinsella through Hoppe said something along the lines of, um, "We don't come to own our bodies like property because we have, in order for us to own property, we at we at first have to own." We have to be autonomous. We have to be self-owners in the first place. We have to be able to, we have to be able to embroider, let's say, thing or like you know, mix our labor, homestead, um, first use, all of this sort of stuff. If the land is unowned, okay, we get on there, first use. We have the first claim to the sort of thing. Then we start to homestead. We're mixing our labor with it, and um, and there we go. You know, we've. We've laid claim to this piece of land, but it would be absurd to say that we could somehow come to own our bodies in the same way that we could own property because we can't, A, mix our labor with our own body. It would imply that we can somehow, or ourselves, we can, it would imply that we would somehow can separate the self from the body. And I don't think that libertarianism really makes or should make a distinction on the mind-body duality, it, you know, <laughs> this sort of thing where, you know, the, the, the if we have a soul, um, that really shouldn't be addressed by libertarianism. We have to get to, there needs to be a better way to address this sort of thing. And he recognized that. So the self can't be separated from the body. And I know Kinsella prefers to, to address it, not self ownership because the self is usually attributed to the mind and the stuff like that. So he calls it bodily ownership instead. So we, we, we own our bodies. Okay. Well, how can we how can we prove that we have bodily ownership? Well, because we have, d- firstly, direct control over it. When Michael uh, decides to, let's say, will his arm to move upward, his right arm, it can move upward immediately. There is a direct control of my of my body in that way. And no other person may have that sort of claim on my my body. They have to use their own bodies indirectly to move my own arm. So so the fact is, is that they are presupposing that they themselves have bodily ownership and that they can in, they can go and physically move my own body in order to claim ownership on me. So it's a presupposition, an a priori argument that that they are 
basically entering into by trying to indirectly control somebody else's body, which is why the person with the mind that can move the arm, left, right, all that sort of stuff, has direct control over it. So it's prima facie evidence that you know, individuals own their own bodies, which is different than property ownership. I cannot, you know, we don't, we don't, we have to make the distinction. So what do you think about that? Um, it reminds me of the, the debate I had with Todd Lewis, uh, the Christian distributist. And mm. uh, one of his arguments against self-ownership was similar to that. Like you can't own your own body because to own something like you own a chair, you can sit on the chair, you can break the chair you can do whatever you want with the chair, but it's not you. It's that. It's you're not the chair. That's the chair's over there. <laughs> so yeah. you are your body, and you, you, like you said, you can't really separate your mind from your body. Not really. Um, and so it doesn't really work. Um, but the way I like to describe it to people is that uh, I own myself, and and that's just a vehicle for describing that I'm responsible for my actions. So <laughs> I like to say, if I strangle a hobo. My <laughs> my hands don't go to jail. My body goes to jail, right? Because yeah. my hands were directed by my body or my mind, right? So <laughs> we, you know, are the effects of our actions. We must own them, right? We must take yeah. complete, full responsibility. Unlike um, agents of the state that often like to say, uh, after committing heinous crimes, um, I was just doing my job. <laughs> you know? he told me you know, to do it. it he told me to do it <laughs> isn't it funny how, how the people who deny self-ownership are the ones who are quick to advocate for essentially the ownership of other human beings like right. oh no you can't own yourself but i'm claiming uh i that i have a higher claim to your labor than you do and i get to tell you what to do which is essentially saying that you own somebody hmm. just had to throw that out there i find that ironic yeah. Okay. So, I mean, the the reason why I brought this up is because, of course, if we make this sort of distinction that, let's say, um, you know, we come to own our bodies in a different way than than property, for instance, we cannot. And this this actually comes into the idea of can we own people? You know, can we can we deal in chattel slavery? Is 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 um can people be treated as slaves? Now, you know, we know that. We can. There have there has been instances in history where people have enforced control over other individuals. Um, you know, this this country has a very uh, poor history in slavery, and uh, we have these sorts of examples of such. But but in the libertarian sense, uh, could we, if we strip all this other stuff away, could we start dealing in you know children or or other people? Could somebody sell themselves into slavery. Right. And this is when it gets into <clears throat> children as property and humans as property. And this, I think this becomes the heart of the matter. Um, you know, if we can do this sort of thing, then we can, then we can see an extension of why a child might actually be the property of the parents. And I don't usually like to use the word property of the parents. I do actually like to use the word trustee or guardianship. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. because, the, because the child does not have the faculties of uh, developmental faculties, the stages of life of a child and into adulthood when you might have dementia later on in, 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 in your life. If you have dementia, what, do you suddenly become property because you can't suddenly say no and walk away? I mean, that would be a very terrible thing. Grandpa suddenly has dementia. He's sitting in the chair. Well, now I can do whatever I want with grandpa. You know, he sits in the chair and he doesn't say no. I mean, you know, start gutting the poor guy. So, right. so that, you know, that, that, that isn't really what happens or that, that really isn't, we, you know, we, we can't permit that sort of thing. And not only can't we permit that, but we, we suppose we, we have to understand that, that humans at least, or I know some libertarians have have quarreled about this that some that you can in fact sell people as chattel slaves but um but I tend to take the side that you cannot actually legally enforce that sort of thing even if the person actually wants to sell themselves because it's a self-contradictory thing um but anyways yeah. we we acknowledge okay so go ahead no I was going to say uh, you you remind me of two things the first thing is um 
I, yeah, I talked about this recently with one person. Um, I think it was with Jim Limber Davis. Yeah, we were saying, can you voluntarily become a slave? Mm. And I don't think so. I think that's a contradiction in terms because yeah. to be enslaved is by definition an involuntary situation. Mm. <clears throat> if you are voluntarily submitting yourself to someone, maybe you're their servant. Maybe you're just, I don't know, an apprentice. You're not their slave because if you want, you can opt out, right? The idea right. of a slave enslavement is you don't have yeah, the ability to opt out. And then, <laughs> oh, I think I was talking to Nick Hazelton. That's right. I remember now. And, and we're like, well, what about BDSM? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, <laughs> that's not that's not enslavement because you have a safety word, right? <laughs> you can always opt that's out. That's true. You can't rape the willing. No, I hate to use. No, that's, that's right. That's the point of of um, you know Stefan Molyneux's um, uh, universally what's that universally preferable be be behavior, right? It has yeah, to right. be. It has to be. Um, I say, yeah. It, it, the definition is a violation of consent. Theft assault, rape, and murder. They're, they're, they have to mm. be a violation of consent. If not, they're, they're not called rape anymore. Um, and, and the other thing you, you made me mention, you made me think of was the, um, there's a video of this, um, this YouTube channel, Learn Liberty. I don't know if you guys have seen any of the videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great, I think great. that's, is that Cato? I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. But great, great channel. And one video you, I thought of was this guy, this philosophy um, professor, went to a, a university and he had these, this board and he was asking the students there, um, what can you sell of yourself, right? Mm. He's like, can you sell your hair? Yeah. You know, people say, yeah, yeah, yeah you can sell your hair. Can you mm -hmm. sell hugs? Yeah, I can sell hugs. Can you sell kisses? Yeah. Can you sell your blood? Can you sell kidneys? Can you sell sex? <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's, it's a fascinating study into um, examining what these people believe um, they have the right to do with their own bodies, and it's funny that some people really believe that, you know, you're okay, you know, it's okay to sell your hair, but you can't sell sex, even if it's your own body and it's two consenting individuals and they're engaging in a, you know, business transaction. It's still immoral and still should be punished. And it's, and it's, a, it's an amazing, um, you know, it, 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 it's amazing witnessing of, of somebody's just, um, how do you say that, cognitive dissonance or just mm. strange um logic that that you know they go into these leaps like no you can't do that maybe maybe like you said daniel maybe it's a maybe it's a, a religious thing you know they, they think it's sinful to do that you know i don't know <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so if we are um you know if we were if we are to grant that people cannot own other people because it is a self-contradiction uh, and i'm completely on board with what both of you said then we we have the matter of children then, which the children the, the child has this this sort of innate you have a direct connection with the child, a natural connection with the child. A mother and a father come together, they have sex, they have a child. Um, the the child is made up of the organisms, the food stuffs that the woman puts into their mouth, you know, the man's sperm, the the woman's ova, um, all of these things that are part of the man and the woman. So naturally you would think, okay, there's a direct connection. So that would be, there's no other person that could have a better claim on a, on a child than those two parents. Okay. So let's say, you know, a man that comes, that walks by and says, I want to have this kid now. You can't take the kid because there's, there's a direct connection that's, that, that supersedes a connection of some man that's just walking by, even though if they, you know, they like the kid a lot, doesn't matter. Okay. So we have that. Now, let's say the same situation occurs where the kid is being spanked by the parents and a person walks by and they say, OK, well, I'm going to take this kid away because you're violating the NAP and you're you know, you're hitting this kid that then the kid doesn't understand what they did wrong. They they're developmentally unaware of, you know, of the consequences of their action. We clearly are against spanking. I, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about that. But but at what sense, at what point does somebody have the ability to intervene and say, you are committing violence against this child, even though they're the parents and they have a direct connection with them? And the parents might say, well, this child is my property. Is the child a property? And at what point do we step in and say, no, mm -hmm. no, you can't do that. That's terrible. The right. kid doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, that, that's a it, it's a good um, I it's a good thing to talk about because 
I think one thing that um, a lot of people get confused when I talk to them about volunteerism is they think that we have all the answers, mm. right? Mm-hmm. They're like, you, what, what do you have? Everything figured out? How, in your little anarchy society, how are you going to do this? Mm. Right? Yes. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm, you know, we're not talking about, we're not claiming that we know the solution to every single intricate moral dilemma. You know, I never claim that. No, what I tell people is, what are your principles? What do you stand for? Right? Mm. And take full responsibility of your actions. Now, um, that doesn't solve every problem. There will be fuzzy areas like what you just mentioned. Now, mm. the, but, but what I would tell people is do what you think is justified and then accept the consequences. Right? So mm. <laughs> do what you will and accept the consequences because, um, you know, and, and every situation is different and you have to assess it for yourself and, you know, you know, um, like, like, like if uh, if let's let's say your neighbor is um, you know has uh, the music on too loud and you can't sleep you know you can either call the police or you can actually go like a civilized human being over to your neighbor's house and talk to your neighbor and right. you say you know hey I can't sleep <laughs> you just turn it down right so I think that um, the idea of volunteerism to me is just huh. taking personal responsibility and not saying you know those politicians over there they're gonna pass the laws. And tell us what's right and what's wrong so that I don't have to think about it, you know. Let's just follow the law. Everything will be fine. <laughs> um, and, but, but no, there are many dilemmas that we have to parse out, that we have to think about. And, um, and I think that's, that's just life, you know. Life is not a mathematical equation, <laughs> right? That's why, there's, that's why it's called philosophy and not mathematics. <laughs> mathematics mm. is not left up to speculation, right? <laughs> mm. Or... Uh, or uh, you know, just just um, you know, ruminating over these interesting concepts. So so, yeah. In th- in that case, I would just I would just say uh, to whoever stumbles upon that kind of family, do what you think is justified. You know, maybe try to talk to the family. You know, maybe try to ask them questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you raising your child like this? Do you really think this is the best way for your child to to become a you know healthy, happy, functioning human being? You know. Um, because, you know, right now they would just say, well, call CPS and have the child take away. But, but we know that, I, I don't know if you guys heard of, um, you know, the interviews of Carlos Morales, the CPS whistleblower. Um, I, I, uh, I have you heard? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard of him. I, I've heard a couple of interviews. I, I don't know actually his full story and I didn't hear about what exactly be, he became famous for until recently, okay. but, um, maybe you know a little bit more about that. Yeah, I was I was uh, yeah fortunate enough to, to interview the guy a little bit. Um, so it was it was a great conversation. It was pretty pretty quick, but but yeah, fascinating yeah. guy, CPS whistleblower, and he's got a great story. Um, he's been interviewed on a bunch of different channels, but but yeah, he really exposes the inner workings of child protective services, and you know why you know why he's you know like like we, we can see how. You know, um, the state mismanages education. We can see how the state mismanages foreign policy, how the state mismanages monetary system. And so he has an inside look at how the state mismanages um, mm. child protective services. And that's invaluable. Um, and so, yeah, he's doing a wonderful service with that. And so really showing that, no, if you, by putting an all-powerful entity, monopoly, in charge of, you know, taking care of children, you're not going to get the best outcome more likely you're going to get the complete worst outcome because it's a government agency you know for i mean for many reasons right the um just because it's a monopoly you know it just you, it's paid for by taxation by extortion by you know it's just uh, no competition all that kind of stuff so so yeah so um basically anything except calling cps would be a better choice <laughs> that's my answer <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, I can I can get on board with that entirely. And in in the society that we live in right now, that would be the last thing that I would want to call. I mean, bringing a dragging a kid through the process of that. Holy moly. But you know what? There are there are instances that I would be at a moral crossroads. And I guess that's why they call them dilemmas, because if I You know, if I don't have the legal justification to walk into somebody's home and take, you know, just kidnap the kid out of the bed that's being beaten every day by the father, breaking my heart. Mm. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, think about it. Go go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say uh, I personally view it as a continuum. And as Mm. as Danilo aptly pointed out, there are 
definitely, you know, there's extremes and most situations are somewhere in the middle, right? Like yeah. generally you don't get to walk into somebody's house and tell them how to run their family. But if the guy's beating and abusing his kids, you can go in there and kick his ass and potentially kill him if you have to. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. most situations just happen to be somewhere in the middle. And, uh, it's not a violation of the non-aggression principle to defend other people. Mm. I think we all know deep down that children uh, do have rights. You know, they may, they're not fully functioning, fully fledged adults yet, but they're somewhere in the process. And for us to, to say, oh, no, they, we don't have to respect them because they're, they're not there yet. I mean, it's all like, like exactly like Danielo said. It's not mathematical equation. And, it, you know, it's funny, we, we recommend a solution or we point out something that's wrong and then we are expected to have the answer to every conceivable scenario. <laughs> uh, so, but what would you, you know, do if, <laughs> yeah, like, well, what if the guy who's abusing his kid has his, uh, little pinky toe on the nuclear, uh, <laughs> launch button. So if you go yeah, to yeah, his yeah. house, the whole world explodes. Like, okay. <laughs> can't solve every possible situation. I I know. I, I don't like to be the person that says that to individuals when they're bringing up the big questions, though. You know, there there are the issue of children is is going to be one that will win people over if we have a better solution. Yes, we can talk about how bad it is right now. And and there are such there's such a dearth of imagination out there that even if we badmouth what's going on right now, they still won't be able to comprehend what could be. So I just want to give them a silver lining or not even just a silver lining, just, a, a, you know, a even a relatively strong or clear idea of how much it could be better without it. And maybe that does come from just a fully a developed understanding of the fact that everything the government does is is bad. And then it just naturally it's an extension that, you know, child protective services must be bad, too. But. Certain people have those certain pressure points that I can get to them, and I want to talk to them through this means. And and children, it it's one of those things that's really important. I know it is important to you, Danilo. So, um, and and Danny as well. I mean, Danny and I are not parents, but you know, I I love kids, and I'm and I'm around them a lot. And I you know I grew up raising my my brother used to be sister. one actually i used to be one <laughs> surprise audience i didn't just pop into existence like this we were i know all it's i know it took a long time to develop in this handsome guy i am right now <laughs> but um but that's why it really gets it, it there are cer certain issues like that that really get to me and i i'm not the kind of person that needs an explanation on everything trust me but i am the kind of person that needs to have the ammunition on the big issues i'm the kind of guy that walter block is in that sense the guy's <laughs> talking about privatize everything he's written a book on every single thing out there i know he's and, awesome <laughs> right right and he's great he's great but i i think that's where my mind is because he's been questioned by all these things about all these things and clearly he sees a reason to to um, exposit upon his philosophy in a, in a, in a reasoned way that I think goes beyond just saying, let's forget about the lifeboat situations, because I don't think that, that dealing with children is a lifeboat situation, but, um, no, anyways, not. no, definitely not. I, yeah, you're right. I think those, um, those extreme situations. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of books that people can read about to learn more about that kind of, um, uh, you know these these uh, speculate spec speculative um, areas, but yeah, in my podcast anyway, I focus on the basics, on philo the basic philosophy, the basic principles and morality. That's hard enough. Yeah, <laughs> to get people yeah. to understand that. Forget about privatizing space. All right, let's just, <laughs> let's just focus on stop hitting your kids mm. and understand the definition of theft. Okay, let's just focus, <laughs> let's try to get people to understand that, and we can talk about. You know, what oh, if you're God. in a dark alley and nobody's yeah, around yeah. and, you know. <laughs> what if a baby comes and mugs you? That's That would be really tough. <laughs> that's that's one tough baby. So speaking of your uh, your podcasting and, and some of your writing, I want to um, I want you to tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now and where we can find you on the web, on social media, because you are a prolific man and you're constantly busy churning on all sorts of great stuff so where should we send our listeners you know it's kind of you to say i'm prolific because i kind of have been feeling like i'm less prolific lately <laughs> because uh, I'm you're just, just being so critical <laughs> i mean i mean i try to keep up with the uh 
you know, the Facebook posts and, uh, uh. you know, the writing and the short video rants, but the, the, the interviews are kind of, kind of slowing down there. Yeah. <clears throat> I have to ramp that up, but, um, <clears throat> um, but yeah, so you can find me on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, my page is peaceful anarchism. Um, and also my name, Danilo Cuellar, C U E L L A R. Um, and, um, Patreon, you know, if you feel free to donate, um, <laughs> patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. Um, and on YouTube, peaceful anarchism on Stitcher and iTunes, like I think you guys are, um, peaceful anarchism. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I love, I, I interview people on all different, um, you know, perspectives, you know, rappers, authors, other podcasters, um, you know, yeah, many, many different types of people. And it's been wonderful. Um, I met a lot of amazing people doing this stuff. I'm sure you guys will as well. You guys, yeah, just started, but I'm sure you guys, you know, you've already met Walter Block, but I, I haven't even talked to him. But, but you know, my, my thing is I love to um, talk to people who I like their style, and I like their message, but they're just, yeah. they're, they're unknown. Nobody knows about them, right? Like, like, I feel like a lot of people try to get, you know, like a new, new podcast, they like, you know, the big guys like Tom Woods and Stefan Molyneux and Jeff Berwick and, you know, and, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, every, but everybody's heard their story. <laughs> everybody's heard Tom Woods and Jeff Berwick's story. But that's why I like to get more the obscure, uh, lesser known people and, you know, try to help you guys out with like your, us. With your like podcast, us. you know, yeah. because I think that's how we can, um, you know, expand the reach of our message is if we help each other with our, uh, you know, with our audience um, audience reach. So, so yes, yeah, so I really appreciate everyone who is just starting to, to, you know, use their social media platform, use their podcast, use their YouTube channel to spread this message. Cause it's such a beautiful message. It's a very simple message. And, um, you know, it's a message that's based in love and compassion and peace and morality. And what are the type of message <laughs> could you, could you possibly have like that uh, and, and I, mean, I mean, the way I look at it is like, how can you possibly be against it? I don't know. It's just, it's just weird that, that people, um, how can you be against morality? I don't get it. <laughs> it's such a strange thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I, I think um, the way we reach people is by, um, you know, being patient with them and, uh, you know, working on our, uh, um, our communication skills. You know, I, I don't know if you know Sterling Lujan from the uh, Psychologic Anarchist. No, have I'll have to him? look him up. He's uh, yeah, excellent. He calls himself. Uh, he, he promotes relational anarchism, or soft anarchism, or compassionate mm -hmm. anarchism. And him and I, him and I are very, very close in style. Uh, and I and he has this page, Psychologic Anarchist, that he he does. He's a lot of great work, and he's a writer. He's written a lot of articles. Really prolific uh -huh. guy as well. And so yeah, him and I, I really, I really identify a lot with him because. He focuses so much on how do we communicate our message, right? You know, we have the logic down; that's great, but we have to communicate it to people. That's the problem. <laughs> you know, like uh, re really quick, um, I was talking to, to Danny on, on our, our on my interview with him that mm. in most people's minds, there's the there's an elephant, and there's a man on the elephant, and the man is representative of logic. The the elephant is representative of the emotion emotional center, lim limbic system, reptilian brain. Mm. And so you can talk to the man as, as much as you want, convince him with your, you know, uh, with your arguments and your theories, but if the elephant doesn't care, you know, uh, the man's going to go wherever the elephant goes, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so you tell the man, go left, and the elephant goes right, what are you going to do about it, right? Not much. Right. So we got to really um, connect with people on an emotional level because that's really where the attachment to statism is, it's on an emotional level. They didn't come to this belief through logic. And most of them will not come out of it through logic. <laughs> right? So that's kind of what I try to do is try to find where your common ground is with people and identify them with them and say, yes, we also care about the poor. We also care about the sick and the elderly and the weak and the disadvantaged and the disenfranchised. Um, but we have a slightly different way of looking at it. So consider this perspective. And, you know, most people do when you, when you agree. Like, you know, I try, to, I try to find, I find myself trying to agree with people as much as possible. Say, yes, I agree with you. Yes, you're right. But I'd prefer to look at it like this. <laughs> what do you think about this, right? So, and in that way, they're more amenable to listening to a different perspective. So, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've heard a lot Maybe about we'll that book. See. I haven't read that book, but yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's. I think it's overquoted nowadays, but that's that's one of the uh, one of the main principles in it. Uh, you know, lavish compliments and praise, and mm. agree, 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 and then um, sort of like the idea of the. Um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, judo misdirection, um, not misdirection, but using somebody else's force against them or, um, not really meeting force with force, but agreeing and then allowing the ideas to sort of permeate and resonate, um, when you provide them in the opposition rather than just clashing immediately. Right. It's so, um, well, that's, that was wonderful. And I appreciate, uh, so much your time. I think Danny and I both do Danny. Um, what say you? The guy is amazing. That's all I have to say. He <laughs> he speaks for himself. Uh, I I'm glad to hear that we all are more or less on the same page uh, in terms of how to treat children. And I think a lot, uh, most people. I mean, really, 99.9% of people I would say are of the same mindset. It's just getting uh, putting that into pre a precise, well explained and well reasoned and uh, well grounded philosophy like we, we know the answer but how do we derive it how do we get there right mm -hmm. and um i think the message of liberty does well enough uh as it does with most other complex social issues uh it gets there it it may not answer the you know the most enigmatic of scenarios but we've already discussed that and why we believe it's sufficient but uh Dan danilo again yes thank you very much for your time uh fantastic insight and uh you're doing great work out there, so we appreciate it from one man to another. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. So, audience, I hope that you found this conversation as useful as I did, and uh, I think Danny did. So, um, you know where to find us next week. But in the meantime, remember, this is Flagship Freedom, the podcast that places you on the front line in the war of ideas until that next battle, take it easy. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.